cool thing about being a part of something like Buffy mm -hmm. that gets like such an awesome fan base is the show is passed on. It's passed on to friends. It's passed on to relationships. It's passed on to the next generation. So many times, you know, people my age will come up and be like, my kids are not watching it. Mm -hmm. You know, and then the kids start dating someone and then they make their boyfriend or girlfriend watch it. And so it has this sort of like longevity that is, it seems like it will never end. I don't know. What is it about the show that you think really, you know, stuck with people that made it, you know, live, live on this long? I think there's a couple of reasons. I mean, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> I'm like the little thing going, grrr. Uh, um, I mean, it's a coming of age story, and, and a good coming of age story is always timeless. And it, it came about at a time where there wasn't a lot of role models for young women. Um, and, and we sort of swung away from feminism that got a really bad rap. 70s, and then we went into this whole Madonna phase that was like the antithesis of that. And I feel like Buffy was like that first wave of creeping back in where so many young women these days are real, um, you know, they know how to stand up for themselves. And, and that, that was an amazing sort of thing to be a part of. You know, a lot of fun, a lot of great laughs, a lot of life and tears and joy, but there was this real underlying message there. It's just made it that much richer. Now, I know the show branched off into different things as it went on, but the base of it all was vampires, of course, and yet that's lived on even longer. Like, the whole idea of, like, vampires and that whole, I was romanticized, and that's incredible. Like, that people are so fascinated by... The Buffy vampires weren't shiny. We didn't that's start. true! <laughs> the OG vampires, yeah, that's right. Before the glitter happened. I mean, I, I don't know if... I mean, I think Anne Rice probably was the first push into vampire pop culture, you know, Interview with a Vampire with Kirsten Dunst um, and Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt. But yes, I think uh, definitely on network television, this was the first sort of genre show that tackled, ta what's really interesting to me about the show is it tackled everyday problems under the guise of this sci-fi, really the vampires, the setting could have been anywhere, the storylines were about humanity. You know, and the vampires represented problems that kids in high school would have. And slaying the vampires was learning to overcome or eradicate your problems, you know. I love that what vampires used to be then in film and television, that's like what zombies are now. Like we've kind of moved on and it's like vampires now it's like zombies with like Walking Dead and all the other films. It's funny how it's kind of just like, it's changing, and it'll be like werewolves soon, and then witches will it be It is werewolves, again. teen wolf. Yeah, teen wolf, yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, I, I think that there's a certain, to me as an actor, what I like about working in the sci-fi genre is there's a suspension of disbelief. And when I go to work, I want to lose myself and not worry about Claire's problems or issues or drama. I want to lose myself in the storyline of the character. Same thing when I watch uh, you know, movies and, and television, I like to have that, I don't, I'm not someone who really wants to go watch like drama after drama after drama because I, that's my life sometimes. I want to watch, you know, the big action movies or the, or the sci-fi, um, you know, stories that allow me, that's escapism. And it's so important for our society right now. Do you favor the, the Joss Whedon action movies at all? You mean the Avengers? Yeah, series? yeah, is okay. I mean, what's not to love? Come on. <laughs> Um, of course, I love that, but I'm also, you know, I you I couldn't I couldn't necessarily I tend to like Marvel better and what Mar the MCU is doing right now better, especially on television. But there's and especially on Netflix to even bring it down a little even more. But um, and Charlie Cox is here this weekend. <laughs> I'm not gonna go see him. Um, but. You know, DC also has some interesting stuff going on, and Wonder Woman was fantastic. Um, talk about a great, like, you know, they waited so long to bring that character back to screen, and they did it, in my opinion, so perfectly. Um, I thought Gal Gadot was amazing in the world. Um, and so, you know, I, I yes, I, of course I like whatever Joss does, um, but there's so many talented directors out there. And side note, Eugene Braybrock is in this room afterwards, who is also a Wonder Woman, so stick around. Small plug. But is, today in television, is there a show that you think it would be like the Buffy equivalent? 
Is there something out there that you think, or is maybe maybe nothing can touch what Buffy did? Do you have an opinion? Um, I don't think. <laughs> don't worry, I'll take this one. I, I watch a lot of television. <laughs> um, I don't think that there's an equivalent per se, um, but I think there that it's opened up and Buffy allowed content to be made that focuses more really on teen issues, yeah. especially uh, now that we have other outlets for series like Netflix, um, where you have shows that focus on suicide or on anorexia, and these types of shows wouldn't have been developed if Buffy wouldn't have led the way in one way or another. I Jessica know. Jones! Jessica Jones. There we go. I just, she's so good, isn't she? So good. You watched The Defenders yet? Yeah. yeah so good also. Um, so, is there a show like Buffy on the air right now? No, and there probably never will be again. But it opened the door for a lot of uh, female-driven content to be created. Um, even you could say, like, uh, Girls on HBO. That may not have ever gotten on the air had Buffy not been there to hear one. Now, how often do you revisit the show? Like, do you ever? It's on, I know it's on Netflix now in Canada, at least. So, do you ever flip back through it and be like, you know, it's kind of like a time capsule of your life? You're like, oh, look at my hair then. And like, 20 years ago, do you, do you go back and watch well, watch the show? Actually, I have not watched rewatched the first season, which was like a half a season, because I decided that I was going to retire. I was really annoyed with the business and you know, the lack of opportunities, um, that they just would fade women out at like 35. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to retire, I'm going to go back to school, I'm going to have a whole new chapter of my life. So what became symbolic of that for me was I cut off all my hair. And I cut it off after my last audition, which was for Buffy's mom. <laughs> and the, that whole first half season, Josh kept saying, yeah, your hair just isn't right. And I, I, I didn't tell anybody I cut it all off, so I just I just couldn't watch it. <laughs> wow. Selfish and small as that. You're just making a joke with the hair, and actually I was actually pretty I was actually pretty bang on with that. You literally can't watch it because of the hair. No. Um, but my favorite thing I think about Buffy was that it started out so black and white, so so simple. You know, good was good and evil was evil. And as the show grew, like, life becomes gray. And life is about the grays. And I just, uh, I, I loved watching that. And I think being a little older than the younger audience who watched it, I got that level of, like, when Angel turns, I was like, oh my god, that's that guy in my three never called me back. <laughs> I'm a big fan of the show, so thank you so much for coming. But we also have a lot of other fans here that have questions too, so let's get to some audience questions. I know we have a mic in the aisle right there. So do we have anybody that has a question? Let's take a trip down memory lane. No? Oh, we got one. Okay. Hi. Thanks for coming. Okay, so I as Mrs. Summers. You play a pretty seri serious character for a lot of the episodes, right? You're like the straight, narrow, but bad candy. Was that, <laughs> was that one of your favorite episodes? Because to me, it looked like you were having a lot of fun. So I'd like to hear how you felt like being really serious and then getting to play this character that was... Oh, it was so much fun. And it really took me by surprise. Because, you know, on the surface reading it, it was like, oh, this is going to be so much fun. But I didn't remember how much I'd forgotten about being a teen. And I put that costume on and was just like in it. And it was, you know, all of these memories and sense memories and feelings came back of how hard it was to be a teen. You know, like it looks fun on the surface, but when you're like sitting in this living room with me the record and you just like the thing in your head is like, you know, is he gonna kiss me? Does he really like me? You know, and it was sort of shocking because you Get all that, and it's like that, you know, living under a set of imaginary circumstances, and it all comes back to you. And um, so that was, it was really fun, but it was also uh, kind of like, wow. I 
think you nailed it, by the way. <laughs> Minions, 
which was fine. Um, or occasionally, and with Sarah a lot, and then later in the season with Dawn, and then very late in the season with the Scooby Gang a little bit. Um, so on the show in particular, I didn't have a lot of interaction. I was, you know, kind of like the one who would come in later and, and say hi and while they were leaving. Um, in my career, I've worked with a ton of great people. Uh, Faye Dunaway, who was amazing, Time Daly. Um, I once did a reading with Meryl Streep, which like was petrifying, and like I could barely hold myself together. I was only like 22, so it was even worse. Um, uh, who are some of their favorite? There's so many wonderful people in the business, and I don't know if you feel this way, but I feel that our business, especially as we get older, it's kind of like a high school. Everybody kind of knows each other, or you're sort of one degree of separation. And so it's just, it's really fun. I mean, I feel blessed to be an artist, and it's, it's really, everyone I work with, I'm great. Every job I have, I'm grateful to have. <laughs> yeah, I think it's more about, it in many ways, I mean, it's great when you get to work with somebody. Like, I worked with Robert Redford for a season, and that was pretty amazing. Um, but I don't know, for me, it's the most exciting thing is working with a good actor um, and, and having it gel between you, having the writing supporting you, having the directing supporting you, and that's the most exciting thing. But I would like to answer the question before about, what was the question? About women young today, young women today. My daughter, um, this is going to sound quite a while, but she was like verbally, it was like this really strange land of sort of sexual harassment by a professor at her university. And when she first told me about it, it was like I had this like fear in my stomach. And she didn't ask me what she should do. It was the first time in her life she didn't ask for my advice. She went and told another girl, and they went out on the internet and they asked people who'd gone to the school, if they had had any experiences, and he was fired four days later. And I was like, wow. <laughs> and that, that's something that, like, Buffy can, I mean, she never questioned it, and I, I would have been terrified. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. It was my last day. <laughs> Makes sense. Makes sense. Well, I was dead, so <laughs> that and the cake in the blue room, red room. <laughs> that, that, I think one of my I can't remember exactly my last day, but one of the last days we were filming like the wrecking ball scene in the hundredth episode where like uh, Xander does the wrecking ball through the wall, and it was his birthday, it was Nicholas's 30th birthday, um, and I think Kelly was there, and I actually got to do the stunt, that was my reward, I'm like, I'm not sure how that's a reward, that you're gonna ratchet me through a wall, but <laughs> okay, <laughs> and uh, it was just kind of a fun day, so even though I did die, it was, it was a, like I said, it was an exciting episode to film and, and go out on, I guess. Makes sense, you guys both had the chance to die on the show, which is kind of no, I didn't die. No. Ben died. No. My body jumped into Giles. Get it in your head. Thank you. And because you're on a show that you know lived out its lifespan, were you, when it was all done, were you able to take anything away, like any little souvenirs from set? Did you keep pieces of costumes or props or anything like that? I took all the underwear they gave me. Oh, wow. It was nice underwear, and I wore it every night. I kept Joyce's earrings. You know, you know, actually, what they did is they, after the seventh season, they had an online auction for uh, set pieces, wardrobe pieces, and this really cool thing happened. Uh, they, my hundredth episode robe, that was this custom made, like gorgeous red and gold robe, was in the auction. And a few days later, I got a package at my office, and I opened it. 
and a fan had bought it and said, only you should have this robe. And it was so amazing. Yeah, he was, he was, it was just one of those really, you guys are awesome. It was a really great gesture, so it's awesome. That's, that's amazing. And it still hangs in my podcast studio to this day. It's a little certificate by it. <laughs> I feel like you don't really need a certificate because you would know if it's real. But I want everyone else to see Oh, it. I see, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Just in case. Yeah, exactly. Hi. Hi there. Uh, my question is about the episode with John Ritter, who's best known for his amazing comedy. Yeah. Did he scare you? Because I found him very scary in that episode. Well, he was scary, but I'm Joyce, so I'm, you know, I'm just delighted and, and having a great time. So you just compartment, you know, you just turn off that part of your head because you're living in those imaginary circumstances, but I really got it because um, my mom is a single mom and she really did like her best, but she really struggled. So it was really amazing for me to play a single mom. And, you know, one of the first single moms on TV where like, you know, it wasn't always going well, and, you know, don't fully understand what's going on around you. It's a little scary, but, um, Was John Ritter scary? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, my mother would like have these men that she was sort of hoping to date, you know, sort of like Joyce, you know, hoping there's somebody out there, a second act. And they would sit on the couch, and I had this whole thing, I was a teenager, and I would be in the hallway, and there was a mirror here, so I could see, and I would wait by the wall, look in the mirror, and the moment he made a pass at my mom, I would like burst through the door. <laughs> So objectively, I was like totally felt for Buffy because I totally had experienced that as a kid, you know? He was an intruder. But that was a really creepy episode. He was so wonderful. He was amazing in that episode of being so out of character for Buffy no one. Yeah. yeah. And he was so loose and his son was a really big fan of the show. And, you know, after I met him, we shook hands, oh my god, it's so like incredible to meet you. And then we went right into kissing tonsil to tonsil. <laughs> <laughs> That's the perfect And it made it seem so natural, like, well, of course. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, you got rewarded by being thrown through a wall, and you got, I mean, it wasn't exactly fair. You're making out with John Ritter and you're... I got to tie up Spike. Okay, I guess. <laughs> I'm on top of them. I guess we all had a lot of fun on set. You'll never know. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Hi. So I have the same question in a way for both of you. One is being the villain, would the other actors treat you differently or was it friendly? And being the mom, did you feel like you were a mom to them or were you more of a friend? Um, I can go first. Yeah. Uh, so the way it worked with Glory is she came on the fifth episode, and I think that Joss kind of wanted to like see if she was going to work before he committed fully to her being the big bad. Um, and, you know, fortunately, he did commit. <laughs> um, but I know I was never treated any different by any of the cast um, or anything like that. It, like I said, it was maybe a little bit isolating because I didn't have a lot of scenes with other people. Uh, other than the minions, and I didn't even know what they looked like because in real life, because they would come in a couple hours before me, and then I'd be done, and I'd be like, "Bye guys," and they're getting you know everything peeled off their faces. So that was a little weird, but no, they were everyone was lovely. Oh, that's nice to hear. Yeah, I think that's the thing that's hardest to realize when you're in the audience because you're watching the whole episode is how you know like we never had a scene together. And the first season, almost all my scenes were with Buffy, so I didn't know any of the gang. And that was kind of weird, because I would watch the show, and they were such a big part of the show, and I was like, well, I never have seen them. <laughs> so I was really happy in the second season, when they started coming over and hanging at the house, and I got to, to know them, you know, and be a part of them. But, there, but I was also, you know, not socially on the set, but there was that thing of being the mom. Thank you. Thank you. Now, how far in advance did you know of, of storyline and 
changes. I, know, I feel like as the show got bigger, they must have got more secretive with you know, letting you know, too much script out at one time. Or, were you well informed as to what was going on? No, it was pretty much secretive right out of the gate. Oh, really? and, and, and everybody was like, you know, waiting not patiently for the next episode. And like, you know, hair and makeup would get it and the wardrobe would get it. So, you know, sometimes they leak a little thing to you about what was coming up. But you everybody just like lived for the next script. You know, wondering what was gonna happen. Because the one thing you knew is whatever job whatever you wanted Joss to do, he was not gonna do. <laughs> so then what was he gonna do? Yeah, no, I, when I got my scripts, I just flipped to the end to make sure I was still alive. And then, once I figured, okay, good, Gloria's still here, then I would start reading my script. I imagine there like, like a lot of screams from trailers as people are like flipping through, because there's a lot of things that probably caught people off guard, or things that were happening, and yeah. Yeah, I imagine so. Wow, crazy. All right. Hi. Uh, so we've mentioned a couple of times about Joyce being dead, and I was going to say that was a gut-wrenching episode for me, so I'm kind of wondering what it was like for you to film that, because it was still so hard. Yeah, it was really hard. I, I, I don't know that I expected it to be that hard, but when she comes through the door and goes, Mommy, I, I, was, I, I couldn't stop crying. You know, and I'm supposed to be dead, so that's kind of hard. <laughs> you know, I keep going, I'm sorry you guys, I'm sorry you guys, I'll get it together. Whatever goes away, it, the next grief, grief, wave of grief just opens up all the past ones. So, you know, and I lost my dad, so it just really, really touched me. And the other thing, because I think Joss lost his mom, too. And so that was, I knew for a couple of years I was going to die. And, um, you know, he really wanted to track what it's like to lose a parent when you're really young. And when I got to the part where Willow just cannot, like, she's, she doesn't know what to wear to the funeral. And I remember that I didn't know what to wear to my dad's funeral either. And she's looking for the blue shirt, mm -hmm. and I wore a blue flowered dress with ruffles on it and hot pink nail polish because I was so lost as to what to wear. So it, well, I'm not kind of, off, kind of going off topic on your subject, but. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. But it was, it was really, it was hard. Yeah, you did a great job. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Hi, Claire Christine. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for Thank having you. us. Yes. I um, also wanted to ask about the same episode. Uh, 20 years on, it's still, uh, one of the most powerful hours of television I've ever seen, and it's it's amazing. And you had mentioned that you knew, or you had an inkling from Joss that you were going to be dying, but when you and the rest of the cast received that script, did it take you off guard? Were you surprised? And what kind of conversations did you have with the rest of the cast about the script and what it might mean and what it might do to all of them? Um. I knew I was going to die, and I knew what season I was going to die in, but I didn't know when it was coming. And interestingly enough, the, they fudged it a bit, like the her coming through the door. I can't remember what, what it was, but they took a piece and they moved it around and shot it in a different order this isn't going to make any sense, so that there was no tip-off. Like, they took a piece of the episode where I died, and they put that onto the last episode, so that when we were, sh the, the episode before it, so that none of us knew that they were already getting ready for it. And Joyce was so happy, you know, because she'd met someone, and she, uh, like, you know, twirled in that dress, and she, there was so much joy that it actually did sort of take me by surprise when I read that script. But it was a really weird thing. People didn't talk about it. It, it was like, in a weird way, going to a funeral. Um, and nobody really, there was this like, sort of somberness on the set. Uh, you know, it wasn't kind of like, oh, uh -huh, you know, business as usual. And we've been, you know, I've been with these guys for five years, not just the cast, but the crew. And, and it was really, um, I think it was kind of hard for everybody you know, to lose the center mom of the show, so. You were the first, you know, main cast to 
to go die. Yeah, yeah, and the only, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, except Buffy, like, three times, but... <laughs> <laughs> Once by me. Yeah. No, and, and I died of, like, natural causes. Yeah. You know? I mean, Buffy can control everything, and she can wipe out all the evil in the world. But she couldn't... She couldn't save her mom from life. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. So, Hi. <laughs> but uh, I was wondering if there was any characters you would like to see like interact more, or any characters you would like to interact more with the show. Um, I would have liked to have interacted more with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I kind of like secretly wanted to be a vampire slayer. You know what I mean? It was like, God, that's so fun. I can't, I don't get to do that. But I loved the scene where the art, the, the, the art that we're doing at the gallery is on the walls and it brings out all those like, zombie characters and so I get to sort of like battle my way. And then the axe that I, you know, take to the school wall, that was really fun, although it was very heavy. <laughs> Thank you. Now, how often do you, you know, run into the cast? Do you guys have like an annual like dinner that you guys all get together, or how does that work, or just kind of events like this? Do you follow my Instagram? Yeah, yeah. You need to follow my Instagram. I see everyone all the time. Sure. Julie and Charisma are my best friends. Emma, um, huh? yeah, we are like a super tight. The women, I always say the women of Whedon. It doesn't matter <laughs> the show, you know, yeah. Firefly or or Angel or Buffy. We're all super close still. Now, if, you know, because we are into this 20-year anniversary, what if they were to bring it all back and you could be alive again, and would you would you do it? Would you do, like, one, like, a revival season? I feel like this is the time now where, you know, Will and Grace is back on the air and all these, all these shows. Like, what if they came to you and said, hey, we want to bring it back for one one more go? Would you would you do it or do you want to leave, kind of leave that there? I want to just leave it there. You know, it, it just, I don't know, how do you feel? Well, I mean, it's a little different for me because yeah. I was not, you know, part of that core, that core group. Um, I think that eventually, I mean, let's be honest, eventually there's going to be some sort of Buffy revival. It's going to happen, whether it's in five years, ten years. I mean, there's been rumors about it a couple of years ago. Somebody was writing a script and, you know, but the timing has to be right and the approach has to be right. And it's not going to be as simple as a, you know, Girl Meets World, or a, you know, Fuller House, or you know, there has to be, it's such a special show, Joss has to be in charge, yeah. um, and Sarah has to be in it, yeah. and then once you sort of build from there, you have to look at what's, what's working in television at the moment, and what do you want to be, you can't recreate Buffy, it wouldn't make any sense to yeah. like, try to recreate the Scooby Gang, or bring everybody back as they are now. But let's look at, you know, like, for example, what Netflix is doing with the Marvel properties, and let's think about, like, something like that with a Buffy sensibility and maybe a few ties to the show. That, to me, would be appealing. I don't think it'll ever work where it's like, okay, now you're, all of a sudden, the whole cast is back and it's 20 years later. That would be, like, geriatric Buffy. <laughs> But there's, I think the, there's room for it, and there's certainly the interest for it, and so eventually, I think that something will be done with the IP. That's just a personal opinion. The whole like vampires don't age thing, that would be tricky too. Well, like, but, I mean... You know, it's been 20 years, it's like, mm -hmm. You know, not, there's not too many, I mean, there's some vamps on the show that are the main cast, but that's not, that's not the predominant. It's true. You know, I think that I think that that wouldn't really be an issue. You yeah. know what I mean? Sure. It would be interesting if Sarah had a daughter who was the new Slayer, and mm -hmm. so oh, yeah. there is Sarah's joy. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If Sarah was Joyce. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but like, or if Gloria was Joyce. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great idea, isn't it? <laughs>
<laughs> yeah. Just all the daughters of all the characters. I don't know. I mean, what do you guys? I'm really curious. Um, so if anyone wants to come to the mic and give their opinion, I'm really, really curious what you guys think would work or wouldn't work with. I mean, I know that we are so satiated and hungry for more Whedon content on television, and, but I don't know how the Buffy format would fall into place. So if anybody wants to give their opinion, I'm definitely curious. Yeah, let's hear it. And we have, I think we have one more question, too, so let's go there. You can have a question first. Yeah, let's do it. We won't pressure you for your opinion. My question is for you. You have oh, goody. the best wardrobes in the time for women. How did you enjoy really all those amazing dresses? They were, it was amazing. And that first red dress, like, that really hit it off on a good note. That was a Prada dress, you know. Um, very expensive, very, very nice. <laughs> um, and the shoes, and to me, as an actor, I work in a way that the more layers I put on, like the more I change my physical appearance with wardrobe, with maybe makeup and accent, center of gravity, those things enable me to be much freer. That if I, that's why you usually don't ever see me play like a girlfriend or a, you know the girl next door or the you know the lovely ingenue who's falling in love because that's just not me as an actress, you know. So all the elements of glory really help bring the character forth. Um, there were times where the wardrobe was not so nice, like, for example, when I was wearing a leather dress filming at like 4 in the morning. <laughs> and, or when I'd go in at like 4 a.m. to a call time and they'd put me in a leather dress and like do all the makeup. But for the most part, it was such an essential element of the character, I loved it. Yeah, I mean, when the wardrobe and the people are doing like their creative best, as an actor, it's like stepping into the skin of the character, and it, it and it, it adds this whole other layer to your comprehension of who you are. Yeah, it's like Buffy and her husband her tops or Willow and her fancy shirts. <laughs> These characters are known for their very unique outfits. Mm -hmm. Yes. Another funny wardrobe story, super fast, is uh, you know you're right. Everybody was known in the wardrobe was high end, like. Sarah had beautiful jewelry and, you know, clothes, designer clothes, everything was great. So sometimes the budget would trickle down to me <laughs> after the main cast was all in their designer duds. And one time the wardrobe person brought out this pair of like silver lame pants and was like, oh, how about Glory wears these? And I looked at her, I was like, weren't those your Halloween costume that you're now trying to pass off on me? <laughs> so that was kind of a funny little moment. Okay, spin-off idea? All right, Go yeah. for it. Okay, the whole room wants to know. Alright, well, I really felt, I kept thinking, okay, they gotta do this like next year, right after the series ended. Because they kind of set it up, like Buffy was gonna become the new Watcher, right? Because all these, all these uh, vampires letters were now being born, so I kept thinking they were gonna have this thing where she's traveling the world and kind of starting out the new Watcher's Guild, looking after all these, all these, you know, New Slayer, so I still think that could happen. She could be older and already have a big growing. I like that concept. Yeah, that's great. I was kind of hoping she'd come in at the end of Twilight and just. <laughs> 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 Never happened, though. Never happened. After credit scene, nothing. So, what you're saying is you watched all the Twilights. <laughs> I mean, you can't get involved and not see the marriage, like the wedding at the end, like, come on. So you right? got involved with all those I was very deeply emotionally involved in those films, yeah. Hey, this isn't about me, right? It's about <laughs> but before we wrap, let, let's uh, switch gears to, instead of talking about the uh, past, let's talk about the present. Now, I know you are working on, uh, you just did directing, right? Yeah, I just directed um, my first feature documentary. It is... It is the story of wheelchair athlete Andre Kylik, who lost both his legs in a accident in Prague in 2003, when he was like 23, and they said he wouldn't live, that he wouldn't even sit up again, and he would never walk, and now he walks with prosthetics, and he is like an ultra, ultra hand cyclist athlete, and he does double Ironmans and these crazy races. Well, he spent three years trying to qualify for this race called Race Across America, 
which leaves from Oceanside, California, and ends up in Annapolis, Maryland. You have to do it in 12 days. So these athletes sleep like 90 minutes to 30 minutes a, a night. I mean, it's insane. And so we got together a crew, Greg Rumberg produced it, um, and we filmed him going cross country for these 12 days. And I just got, I'm getting the footage back. I sent it up to Canada, to here, um, <laughs> to get time coded. I ran seven cameras almost for 24 hours a day for like 14 days. So just to time code everything took like the last two months. Now the footage is on its way back down to LA and I'm going to start going through it. The film's called Joyrider. Go on Facebook. It's there. There's some footage and pictures that I've posted. The cinematographer is amazing. It's going to be an amazing movie. So I hope you guys check it out. Um, I had a pretty crazy year this year, but I did a film last fall called Before, During, After. And um, it was the first time I ever worked with my husband. Oh. Which was really, uh, really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> As you'll have it. <laughs> no, it was great, but we're so different. He's still your husband. Though, right? He's still my husband. Okay, all right. He's still my husband. Good. Yeah. No, but it, it, it was great, though. I mean, all these decades and decades as, as actors, we'd never worked together, and that was really. Uh, it was really an experience. It was fun. Very cool. So, right. yeah, and if you want, for me, if you want to keep up with me on social media, I am on Instagram, Claire Kramer Official. Someone else have my name. And on Twitter, just Claire Kramer. And I love hearing from you guys. So tweet the pictures we take and send them my way. And spin off ideas. And spin off ideas. Well, you know, don't send those to me. You can send those to Joss. Yeah, yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> yes. All right, everybody. We'll give it up one more time for Christine. Yeah. Yeah.